guardians over to them. And uh, they went from being a best off, no one old enough to run the farm, and having to get out of there. And you know, the little things that uh, children will remember. My mother was very sensible. Uh, she was a better theologian than she knew. Instead of saying something to us like, remember all your relatives at Bass, she'd just pick a different person every time. Whenever I said Bass at home or Father Amen or whenever she was with us, she'd say, now, today would you remember Auntie Mary of Blaha Kaharim? Would you remember Auntie Joan of Oxide? Remember your uncle so-and-so? She'd pick a different person. And, uh, and I think that's very healthy because you'd want to know what was it about that person that you mm -hmm. loved. And one of them, for example, was Auntie Joan of Castletown. She was not my mother's aunt, but by an aunt of her father's, her grand aunt. But she had a store in Castletown Bear, and she had all these bolts of material. And uh, it was after my mother's father had died in America, and her mother had to find some way to sell the farm and come back to Pete. And uh, uh, so uh, she'd bring her little girls down there. She had four little girls and a little boy, and uh, she'd say, pick out the material. And being well trained by their mother, they knew that they went from the cheap material here the expensive material over here, and they start looking at this cheaper material. Auntie Joan would say, oh, no, 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 and leave them over there. Was well, something, you know, that uh, a little girl, that by this time she was probably maybe uh, 12 years old, and a kindness shown. She wasn't treating her grandchildren, grand nieces, and so on, uh, as poor relations. A kindness show that my mother remembered in yeah. in late years. But was your mother's was your mom your 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 grandparents' farm was it in on the Bear Peninsula? Yes, right in you could look across from my father's island and see it. So it was around the Irish Irish thing. Yeah, it was over at Carakeen. That'd be if you went south of Aries and then went west, uh, going along the road there toward the Bass Rock. The Bass Rock would be within about uh, here to the school lines from where my mother was raised. Okay. That particular spot. And you know, it's the second, uh, there are two mass rocks in that area. And a cousin of my mother's, Michael Sheehan, uh, had a very simple little granite cross put there. Uh, but the nice thing about it is, so many places in Ireland you don't know where the Bass Rock was. And I like the idea of keeping those traditions alive. One of the things I'll give you is a, a lower bone uh, to keep that tradition alive. Uh, the, uh, uh, the last place where a priest was put to death uh, while uh, saying Bass was at Glen Bank, just beyond our group tiny little, mm -hmm. it's a cul-de-sac. There are mainly Crowleys lived there. And uh, a friend of mine, Father Emmett Harrington, climbed up the side of that hill and said mass there. But uh, either someone betrayed the priest, or else someone was asleep at the, the vigil. Someone was supposed to keep watch. Mm -hmm. Then he got killed. But uh, just looking at the that uh, cul-de-sac. I think betrayal is more likely. But that was very rare. It is amazing when you think of all the enticements that were left to you to pull you away from the faith. Uh, if, for example, uh, I had a son uh, working for you, and you're my brother, and you, the two of you get into a fight, and uh, then uh, he could... Uh, tried to get even by uh, uh, joining the established church and become the heir of his uncle and disinherit 
your own your children so by that one simple thing. Just go to the to the uh, presbytery at Castletown there, and he could inherit his uncle's land. And uh, considering enticements like that, it is remarkable that they stayed with the with the faith. And so many other uh, there were many many other enticements. I mentioned, for example. Uh, how uh, my uh, my mother's aunt was a city clerk here in Future when when in New Hampshire my godmother's people could not even hold public office. Uh, the last vestige of anything anti-Catholic was finally got off of the uh, New Hampshire Constitution in 1941. Kind of a silly little thing. Well, well, did your mom and dad know each other when they were kids? Yeah, they did. Not around, at all. around Kill Catherine? They didn't no, know each other. They could. My mother could look out and see at Ishvardar, and he could see where Karaki was. Where you're at Kar uh, on the island, you see these scallops of green, each getting smaller as you go out toward the end of the mm -hmm. peninsula. And the one farthest out is Klenik. But uh, there's no road to that. Is there anybody on the island now? Nobody. The last, it's a curious thing, the last people to live on the island were my grandparents. And they were taken off the island in the year I was born, in the year before I was born. In 1923, my dad's father and mother were taken off the island. But in, uh, uh, by sheer coincidence, uh, it was first inhabited in 1823. My dad's grandfather, Michael O'Sullivan, his parents died within a, about a month of each other. There must have been some kind of an epidemic. And he was 16 years old. And uh, he had three little sisters and a little brother. And he didn't want them farmed out to relatives or put into an orphanage. And he uh, went to Lord Lansdowne. He said, there's no one living on Inish Farnard. I'd like to build a house and fish and raise my little sisters and my little brother. And Lord Lansdowne supposedly said to him that there's a reason there's no one living there, there's no place to birth the home. He said, I'll build a place. And he has friend by the name of Sheehan. And the two of them built with some beams a place we could hoist a boat out of the water. And the, he and she had built a house. And then he, she and then the two that built a second house and she and came on the island. And then the oldest uh, of, uh, the, of his sisters, he married to a she -him. And uh, then when the next one was old enough to marry, she married an O'Neill from uh, out in uh, Cater Daniel in Kerry, and he built a third house on the island. And then the next, the youngest sister, married to a Malvi, and they built a fourth house on the island. Then when my dad's father was old enough to marry, his grandfather, I thought, how shrewd to get away from the grandkids. All the four houses are quite close together. And then the grandfather built, it's about from the tip of the little broken off islands to, to the east side to be almost a mile long. And he built a little closer to America. And I thought, very sensible man, my great grandfather. <laughs> and they, but they, uh, it was a hard life, of course. And on the other hand, uh, during the famine, he kept, my dad's grandfather kept countless people alive. Well, who owns the island now? The, the government? It, uh, no, there are, there are one part of this is owned by a uh, first cousin of mine. Oh. And uh, the others are, I don't know how it is to write it up. There's a, a girl, one of those O'Neills from the island. They later became the O'Neills of the Cross. Uh, one of them, by the way, of those O'Neills I think of every day is uh, uh, Nam Willa, which is about uh, 200 miles from Lusaka in Zambia. And you know, the, the 
Holy Father's list. And in Caritas and Trocra, uh, the, the great German Catholic uh, aid society, they've got a list of places suffering from famine. And uh, there's a band of countries in South Africa, above South Africa, but below Sub-Saharan Africa, starting with 